Okay, the Lucerne Valley, Johnson Valley, and this will advise the oh, yeah. 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 session at 501. Okay, let's uh, Bob, would you mind leaving us? Bob? Would you mind leaving us? Bob? Yes, sir. So we do have a quorum. Um, uh, I should make a note of last week, I had gotten an email that, um, that uh, uh, Jean Fuqua was not going to be here, but I didn't check my email in time to see that. OK, the approval of agenda. Looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, we have uh, uh, Lorraine and, uh, or, I'm sorry, Jean Fuqua, yeah, Jean, Jean McGee, I'll get it straight. Uh, Jean McGee made the motion and seconded by Lorraine. Uh, any, any discussion on that before we vote on it? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, uh, does everyone have a chance to read the minutes from last week? Um, I did want to make one comment on the minutes. Um, as soon as I find it here. Uh, on, under F, the Land Use Committee. Uh, Betty, I want to make a clarification that it was uh, uh, it was the Land Use Committee and um, a joint project with La Vida to come up with the, um, the industrial scale solar, among other issues. Uh, and the community plan, uh, part of the community plan. So it, 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 the way it's worded, it makes it look like it was me, but it wasn't. It was our whole, uh, you know, land use committee as well as the joint venture with VDA. So shall I revise that? Say again? Shall I revise that from a new version? No, you don't have to revise it. You can make a note in the, in the minutes okay. that it's been revised. That is if everybody agrees to that. Can you hear me okay? Oh, there she is. Okay, so look for a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, Lorraine's made a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Gene second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Okay, now is the the uh, public comment section of our minute, our meeting. Members of the public wishing to address the council will be asked during this section uh, of the agenda if they have an issue to bring to the attention of the council, which is not an item on the agenda. By raising of the hands, the count the chairman will ask any individual to address the council at that time. Please, <coughs> excuse me. Please honor the three-minute time limit when addressing the council and complete your thoughts quickly uh, if noticed while speaking. On the, uh, while speaking, all testimony given before the council may be recorded. Since council discussion of an item not on the posted agenda is not allowed, these concerns may be addressed in, the in a future meeting as soon as practical under non-action items. For non-action items and action items, the public will be given an opportunity to speak during the discussion of each item. If speakers wish to pass material to the council, please hand it to the recording secretary for distribution. Legal, political, legislative, claims against the county, campaign, court issues, family law issues are not appropriate discussions for, the MAC, for MAC consideration. 
So at this time, do we have anyone from the public that would like to comment? Yeah, I'm going to go with Pat first. You know. Go ahead. So I was asked, um, what was it like at the County Board of Supervisors meeting when a number of people came forward and spoke directly to the Board of Supervisors requesting that as soon as possible, Land Use Services should present to them um, policy 410 and all the subsections, which are those policies that will protect uh, unincorporated communities from solar in their areas. And um, it was very forcefully said, I think I'm going to count four, went down to San Bernardino. There was maybe that many uh, in Hellendale, and there was at least maybe five or six in Joshua Tree. So it was a very, I think they got the message, get it as is to, this is talking to the planning, get it to the planning commission. Okay? All right. Thank you. Oh, was there anybody in opposition? No. Oh. I like that. Is it, uh, you had a public comment, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I had an opportunity. You're going to have to stand and... I hate to do that to you, but you're on camera. Yes, uh, my name is Mike Williams. I've lived in the valley for 40 years plus. I'm a homeowner, property owner, and a trash. Um, I have trash service, both bins and roadside pickup. But last week, I had, uh, I've had my car trailer about half full for the last year sitting in my yard. So I hired a couple of guys to go with me and uh, empty my trailer out because my back was aching. I couldn't do it myself, which I normally would do. So at any rate, uh, I get out to the dump with my dump card, which has never been punched. In the last three or four years, it's never been punched, never went out there. And uh, the guy turns me away. Turns me away without pulling the tarp. I mean, this is a legal load, the tarp and the whole shot. A car trailer, half full, never even pulls my tarp or allows me to pull my tarp off to show him what's on it. Turns me away and tells me I gotta go to Barstow. Well, I couldn't go to Barstow because I didn't anticipate going to Barstow, so I didn't have enough gas in my truck to go to Barstow. Otherwise, I would have took to Barstow. But it was just... And then, you know, I know better than to raise my temper with any of these guys. You wind up in jail real quick, you know. But um, as I was pulling out, I'm looking at this other trailer, same size as mine, and it's loaded with just tree trimmings. And guess what? He turned him away, and, uh, and I couldn't believe it. So I don't know what's going on with our dump out there, but it's totally ridiculous what's happening. I mean, um, used to, the last time I was out there two or three years ago, they always had two or three bins out there with a tractor to move those bins around. If one got filled up, he picked it up, moved it out of the way, and slid a new bend in the way and to dump so that you could dump in it. So I don't know what the situation's changed, that the county's cut back, there's no tractor, no bins. I don't know what's going on, but it's got to change. Why do I have a card? They send me a card every year like they expect me to go out to the dump. Well, I ain't never going out there again, I guarantee you. You know, I mean, what's the use? They told my husband, he went out to the dump the other day, and they told him it was strictly garbage from your household, and they turned him away also. Garbage from your household? Garbage from the house. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. It. You know, I mean. You know, there's, a, I forget, maybe Richard, somebody know what county department run, oversees the, the contractor at the dump. Is that environmental health? Solid, solid waste. Solid waste. Um, you should be able to get the, the number for solid waste. And I recommend that everybody call this head of problem because it sounds like something's not right. Yeah. 
It's um, definitely not right. I probably, to I mean, be me, I would have just backed up and started doing it anyway, dumping it anyway. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, <laughs> like I say, that's a quick way to go to jail. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, well, you're uh, not listen, by the time the sheriff responds out there, <clears throat> I'll be long gone. <laughs> it did. It just surprised me. You're a good uh, I mean, uh, Here I got a car. I'm ready to dump a load, which should have been totally legal. And uh, the guy never even allowed me to pull my tarp to show him what was on board there that should have been able to, to dump, you know. So that's all I got to say. Sorry, all right, thank you. Check that dump out. We had a guy named Robert out there that, by golly, Robert now, he would take that tractor. He'd unload your trailer for a $5 bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on just one second. Uh, I didn't see who was first. Chuck, I think Chuck was before you, Linda. I won't forget you. You're unforgettable. Oh, okay. Yeah, that can happen out there, but it's not normal. Um, maybe Mark can help us. Uh, Athens is the contractor for the county that runs the the dumps and the our transfer station. Were we talking about transfer station? We're talking about our transfer station right out here in Camp Rock Road, right? And uh, sometimes they have replacement people there, and they just get goofy. So if maybe you could have solid waste talk to Athens because there's a list of stuff they can take plus there are five or six tires per load and there's recyclables and uh, sometimes they will take green waste they'll take the branches and stuff sometimes they don't but there's no reason why they should not have taken that load so I dealt with them before and if I get your name after the meeting yeah. uh, your phone number I can't take care of it and also on March 17, um, we're doing a household hazardous waste collection to find the fire station. So even though it's March 17, I'm letting you know now. And uh, the county's coming up to help us so they can take this entire list of stuff. And it'll be in the newspaper and the leader. And if I could get it posted here at the CSA 29 office. So, so it's the 17th of March? Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've got Disregard my email. I thought it was this this Saturday. It's March seventh, seventeenth. Okay. So you can disregard my email to you. Okay, Roger. Thank you, uh, Linda. You can do it. This is to um, add to what Mike said. You need to look at the mic to do it. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, we live at, on Highland and Clark. That's about a half a mile as a crow flies from the center of town. Between Highland and Crystal Creek, Clark crosses the flood channel. Somebody has taken to dumping there. They've decided that's a good place to dump, right on the aprons of the flood channels. About three months ago, it was a, a, a load of tumbleweeds with, littered with a bunch of garbage. And then about two months ago, another load of tumbleweeds littered with more garbage. And then about a week ago or two weeks ago, three couch cushions. And then somebody added a tire. And Bill is being a sucker and picking it up for him. He should not. I think we should make the county. We should just let it accumulate and make the county pick it up. <laughs> but... This is what happens when the dump is too far away, and I'm sorry, Chuck disagrees with me, but I, that dump should not be there. It should be closer to town. We'd even, if it was just a transfer station, we have some property we might consider, if we, unless we give it to the senior community someday, some eon, some decade. 
some century. But I just want the county to know that by making the dump that inaccessible and that hard to get to, it's what's happening on Clark one quarter mile or one half mile from town. So please, if the MAC would even request we do a transfer station somewhere closer, it would help. Okay, wait a minute, I think I had one. On that subject, on that subject. Oh. On that subject. Relax. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a quick night, but I guess I was wrong. No, it's not. Quick for me, though. Uh, code enforcement has been out here in the community cleaning up some of these because we've reported some out in the Russell Tract area, and lo and behold, they showed up, cleaned it up. So it was nice to see that. And we had, but we've had some enormous thing. I mean, jet, jet skis and and things the size of pickup bodies and stuff like that dumped right close to you know highly traveled roads. So code enforcement does seem to be a little more proactive now on this, and so just give them a call and let them know. In the street? Yeah, I know. Well, Omnia, they, there's pockets there. <laughs> All right, Richard, thank you. Ma'am, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. You can have it on a different topic also if you want. It's a totally different topic. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dee, and I live on the east side of town off Rabbit Springs. And lately we've had this juju bee farm move in, and they got trucks running this smelly stuff day and night out there. Um, with the help of the sheriffs, we contacted a, a deputy and uh, it seems within the last three days that they've ceased until 6 a.m. to start rolling in four to six trucks at a time until it, they start coming in about two or three trucks at a time. And these are big, large semi-trucks. The smell's atrocious. Um, I can't even go outside of my home most of the time. If the wind's blowing my way, you can't even breathe in. It's, it's, it's a horrible odor. Um, we got clouds of ravens picking through it. There's trash in it. Um, they're breaking up the road. I mean, you name it, it's all going on. And I've called every agency and asked for help. And so I just thought I'd come here and address it to you people. I might have a teeny bit of, of hope for you, just a teeny bit. Uh, Chuck Bell and myself are meeting with the, and with the uh, is it EHS, Environmental Health Services Count. Uh, uh, eight, eight, with the county, uh, re addressing this problem. So what, you're at Rabbit Springs, and what's your cross street? I live off on the corner of Rabbit Springs and Lakeview, right up. Um, I'm just basically the next home up from the corner of Dallas and um, Rabbit Springs. So it blows right up into the back of my home. And I mean, you can't. Okay, well, so, uh, I'm thinking we're, we're trying to get a, take them on a tour. So yours is, sounds like the freshest one. Uh, where, where would I find that from, Dal that from Dallas and Rabbit Springs? Where would I look for that field? You, you would travel east on Rabbit Springs, and uh, Lakeview is the next street up that goes north and south of Rabbit Springs okay. with Meteor and another road in the middle. I forget the name. Yeah, I, I, okay. They say you're aware, they're already aware of it. So. Okay. I talked to you last week on the phone, remember? Yeah. Oh, you were the person I talked to. Uh, I'm the trash guy. Yeah. I'm the I, I'm the one that invited you for breakfast outside with me in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thank you, everybody. Well, there gonna be a little poopery on the table there. Okay. Is there anybody else that have public comment? Going what? Oh, there's a hand back there. Go ahead. I, I couldn't see you. I just saw your hand. We're all doing that. I thought I would um, share with you some information that I received today. And it's about the DRECP, the solar. Their BLM's going to have a series of meetings. Uh, the first one will be in Lone Pine, 
The second one will be in Ridgecrest. The third one will be in Hesperia. That's as close as they come to us. Um, at the Courtyard Marriott on the 28th from 5 to 7 p.m. On Thursday, March 1st, they're going to be at the Joshua Tree Community Center. And again, 5 to 7. On all of these, it's 5 to 7. Then there's going to be one in El Centro and then one in Bakersfield. And the last one is going to be at Palm Desert at UCR's um, center there, the auditorium. And um, some of us who care should, care should make sure we attend these meetings because we're, we have a commitment to our neighbors. And while it won't impact me except the view, I have a friend who, on a proposed solar, will be surrounded on three sides, one as close as 50 feet. Okay, thank you very much. Any other? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. If she's got, let her answer that in her, in our presentation, in her presentation. Okay, so let's, let's uh, if we're uh, public comment, let's move on to guest speakers. And um, Richard, did you want to go first? Yes, okay. please. Thank you, because i got to leave. I'm changing up the order here. <clears throat> Richard's going to talk on senior housing project. Well, as the community probably knows, for going on the fourth year, we've been trying to formulate a, com a community housing project. Can you hear okay? Yes. Okay. And um, so we started back in... No, oh, what was it? October of the 14, I think, when we started talking about the, you know, with the, in the community. Yeah, right. You keep your mouth shut, will you, please? <laughs> so what's he's bagging on me too much? Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, we uh, we actually finally got to the point. I'm going to cut this short. It's a long story, but we got to the point where we did a needs assessment, thanks to Hitch and Lucerne, who helped fund that. And when I say we, I mean LaVita. And uh, we finally discovered that there was, you know, truly a need in the area for an affordable housing project for seniors. And, this, and the original concept of this is a rental pr project. Um, when we say the area, we mean the Morongo Basin to the Victor Valley to the Barstow area and purportedly to the San Bernardino Mountain communities. And we're reaching out to all these communities to try and, and get the interest. Now, the problem with this project is we have the need. I have stats, but I don't want to belabor all that. But, but in our needs assessment that was done by Alfred Gobar and Associates, that's a familiar name out here, and um, they're a professional economist, you know, concern in, in Tustin that did a wonderful needs assessment. Basically, it's a lot of demographic information. And uh, the, the region hosts about 305,000 residents, and we've got 70, over 72,000 of them are seniors. We have, um, you know, there's, gonna, there's a projected increase, which would be 88% of this projected increase in the next, you know, probably 10 years would be in the senior category. Um, so we're trying to get ahead of this. There's... There's, I think, 11 senior housing projects in this area that goes all the way from Yucca Valley to basically Hesperia, because that's where they are. And um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find a way to fund this. The land's been donated, and there's a 109-acre parcel of land to be, that we only need 27 acres of for the project. But... And uh, we've been working on, can we get water rights? Can we facilitate the utilities? And, and we also would like to turn this into a net zero, you know, in, uh, environmental project where it's, 
uh, you know, not an impact on our, on our resources. Um, so if you've been to Levita over the years, you, you've heard us talk about a lot of it. We are now at the point where we've given a copy of our report, we call it a report, uh, to Mark here to review and, and hopefully share with uh, Molly and uh, Ramos's office. And we, you know, a couple of years back did have a discussion with the uh, Economic Development Housing Department with the county about this. It was a little bit out of their urban box because it is a rural nature uh, community and type of project. But I wanted to let people know that uh, we've been through a lot of the hard part and now the, the next hardest part is how can we fund this project? Whether we can get a, you know, a federal HUD grant or something like that based on a severe economic uh, uh, community, economically disadvantaged community that Lucerne Valley is. So I just wanted to keep this in everybody's mind. Uh, I was reading an article the other day in the Senior News, and it just made me think I need to get a hold of the, that paper and get them over to our next Levita meeting, because they had an article about needs assessment in the desert. And uh, of course, you know, one of those items happens to be, well, what's, what do we have for retirement housing out here? So uh, anyhow, I just wanted to keep this fresh. Linda has brought in copies of this uh, what did we call this in the end? We called it an economic report supporting a senior veteran's housing development in Lucerne Valley. So, which is a great title for what it is. So it went from a needs assessment now to an economic report. So anyhow, um, if you know anybody who, who could facilitate, help us facilitate this project, it would greatly be appreciated. Contact any of us at Levita or even any of the MAC members and and Gene McGee's on Levita, or even Mark here, the field rep. So that's really all I wanted to say. That's about all I had, you know, to bring focus to. We've been talking about it a long time. We finally, you know, we have a report that's very in detailed on the demographics and all that, and it really shows that there's a need. And 24% of the population in this uh, high desert are of the senior age group. 24, almost 25 percent. Millie. How much? This is probably in the neighborhood of a $20 million project. That's the complete project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Are yeah. You do it in phases? Or Could. Or depends on funding. Could be done in phases, yeah. So what is the start of the first phase? Excuse me, I'm used to being recorded. So if you don't have a microphone, could you repeat her question so that you get picked up? Well, give her a microphone. We got one over here. The question was, what is about the valuation of the project? And we're, we're at, right now it's estimated in the ballpark of about $20 million. It could come in less. When we started, we, we had 108 units, I mean 150 units, and we've pared it down to 108. Um, we lost some property that was available too that helped us make it a 150 unit project. but. Originally, we thought it could have been a three-phase, you know, 50-50-50, but we're down to 108 units, so it could be two or three phases real easy. It all depends on how we could fund it, how the, you know, what's involved, whether we get grants or not, or if there's, we could get private backers, um, and, and there's tax incentives if you're a large enough developer, but large developers aren't interested in Lucerne Valley. We've had a few of them out here, but they they shake our hands, say nice things, and we never hear from them again. So, so this is you know it's a, it's a hard one to put together when you don't have the funds to build it, but the land's there. Yes, he he has a question back there. Go ahead, Millie, if you had something. I I, I believe Millie. I remember um, large developers doing large developments housing developments were required to uh, phase in a certain amount of low-income housing. Uh, that's in true. That development. That's true. So, uh, I mean, uh, you would think that that should take care of a lot of it. Because believe me, the Southern Valley is going to get its share this next boom. And that boom is knocking on the door right now. Yeah, it is. 
No. Go ahead. So we're going to get our fair share. Yeah, let's hope we do. Okay, Millie, please, what you're going to say. It's okay. I, well, I had two questions. The yeah. first one is, what would the first phase cost? And then the second one is, has Joe Brady been out to look at this? Oh, yeah. We've had Joe Brady out here. And he, he, he honestly he hasn't been a big help. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we had him out here a couple of years ago. He tried to steer us in one direction that turned out to be a failure. So, so um, Cost of the first depends on what the first phase is. You have to define it. Infrastructure, meaning putting in wells and pipelines and putting in uh, septics and all that, that's uh, probably a good $5 million right there. Uh, if first phase was, you know, I don't have numbers and I wasn't prepared to talk about, you know, the cost. I'm just talk because we don't know how we would phase it. But probably would have a, need at least a minimum of $10,000 to get it off, the, or $10 million to get it off the ground. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm thinking of something else. But it would probably be something in that neighborhood, Millie. Does that answer your question? Yeah, my thought is that if you're asking for money, you need to be able to tell how much money Well, need. what we're asking for is we need more assistance in the project. We need, I talked to Molly early on about possibly getting some financial assistance to take it to another step when you do a prospectus for a project. Now, prospectus for a project is going to lay out all those costs. You know, so all I can do is talk about estimates right now. Uh, when I originally had 150 unit project, we were up close to $30 million because of putting in all the... The problem with developers is they want the water and sewer right in the street already there. We have to build that. And but the property can generate a lot of future commercial and then probably at least a couple hundred homes like a Jess Ranch beyond that. You know, so there's a lot of potential to this that's behind you know, that can come down the road behind this project. But so what I was talking to Molly about at one time was trying to get enough help from the county, maybe through economic development, to actually start uh, formulating a prospectus for it, you know, or we take a different direction. Frank. Could I just suggest that a similar type of project was finished recently in Bloomington? I don't know if you're familiar with that, Mark, um, Josie Gonzalez's office, that they were able to get how the funding for the project down there, so that might be a place to start. There's your urban project. See, that's the problem with Dino Fuentes, is she put it in an urban box, and I says, and again, my comment, you know, the developers expect the water and, and sewer and power all to be right there at the properties, and they build up instead of out, and we're not doing that. And so, you know, I think we need to refocus that economic development, if that's what we're going to do. So, but I appreciate the comment, really, for sure. We'll get the mic. Uh, okay, I want to make this the last question so we can move on. Right. I get to move on too. First of all, I got to say, yeah. <laughs> Turn it on. Bottom. Oh, it is on. Hello. Okay. That's better. I'm ashamed of myself. I have not been attending this Levita meetings and all that. I used to years ago, but I fell to the wayside. At any rate, you know, we were this close with our golf course project, having sewer infrastructure, which would have immediately went up and down our highway, and, you know, there was no hiding that. So they bogged this golf course down with lawsuits, and from my understanding, they've been cleared up now. So I don't know who's got control of what, but there is infrastructure planning for sewer and all that out there. So well, that's if that project that? would build. See, if that project were to, you know, materialize and build, yes, all that would happen. CSA 29 has the water and, and sewer power, so they would inherit the systems and all that operationalize and the, and the pumping rights and all that. Uh, but the project's up for sale. You got $145 million? No, I don't. But there's well, it's up for sale. So... 
I, I, you know, I don't have high hopes that any of that's going to happen. We don't certainly count on that sewering pro, uh, ability to come, and I don't think we'll ever see a golf course out there. So, I think that project's going to get scaled back anyhow. So, anyhow, that we're done then, right, Roger? All right, thank you, Richard. Appreciate okay, it. thank you all, and keep it in back of your minds, and come to Levita because we, you know, discuss more in Levita. So, we'll let Pat have her time now. So. All right. Thank you, Richard. Our next speaker is Pat Flanagan. She has an update on air quality and related topics. Some of you have seen some of this before. I don't want to be too loud. Am I okay right now? Okay. Um, and I've done a little revamping, and then I've added on about the DRECP. But um, at this point, we're putting the air we breathe at risk. It's our... Uh, challenges are both unmeasured and unknown in terms of building utility-scale solar developments on strand, sand transport paths in the Mojave Desert. And there we go. Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, one of the, when you say, what's wrong with solar? Nothing's wrong with solar if you put it on rooftops. Uh, but large-scale solar energy is most efficient in the desert on 1% slopes or less, and that's only about 8% of the desert basin and range landscape. These deposits, these basins have uh, fine-grained alluvial dust that blows in the wind, and I think Lucerne Valley is totally aware of that. And this is from a research paper uh, from USGS. Based on archaeological evidence and current census and tax assessor records, humans have been occupying these basins for over 13,500 years, and the basins include Morongo Basin, Landers, Homestead Valley, Lucerne Valley, Newberry Springs, and we're familiar with the health effects from wind-blown dust. The inhalable dust particles are labeled particulate matter 10, or PM10, which is state and federally, federally regulated substance. And the state and federal regulations for ground clearing projects, they require some things. They require an accurate measurement of PM10 on two-year baseline throughout all seasons. They require effective mitigation, and they require monitoring and enforcement. And these requirements are not being met for solar projects, and they are affecting our health, quality of life, and the environment. So as an example, uh, from my house, I, am, I live down um, in Desert Heights. I look at the marine base, and there you have the Bullion Mountains in the back on a beautifully clear day. And you will notice the fine grain deposits, which form sand ramps on the Bullion Mountains. The red arrow is there so that on this picture, you can see where we are. You can't see the Bullion Mountains at all. And that's fine grained Aeolian dust obscures the marine base. The source of the dust is Johnson Valley, OHV area, plus Lucerne Valley when it's blowing, and it comes in via the winds. And the local vegetated area is not the dust producer. That's the thing to note. So it rides on the winds. Who is the producer? The producer is uh, OHVs riding in Johnson Valley um, and Lucerne Valley Lake, uh, the two solar fields up on Camp Rock Road and other cleared areas within Lucerne Valley that, uh, so that the ground does not stay stable in a big wind. Several dry lakes, yes. Um, Joshua Tree, uh, which we'll see more about in a minute, is on what's called a sand transport path, and so are you. And you can drive, it's a linear dune. And it, you can actually drive it, take you two hours and something, to get from Joshua Tree down to Mesa Verde by the Colorado River. And you think that's a very strange pathway it takes, but that's following the lowest elevations, and it's the mountain ranges that make the wind twist and turn, and that's the way the wind blows the dust. Oops, backward. Okay, uh, when the DRECP was originally planned, they used uh, maps from Data Basin and the DRECP gateway mapping area showed the sand transport path. The red arrow there on the right shows the Clark's Pass, and that little green arrow is where we are, and I'll show you why it wasn't showing up. 
Within the green arrow, dust sources include three solar facilities, equal 350 acres, Copper Mountain College, Coyote Dry Lake, and dirt roads, and where vegetation has been removed. The active sand sources, Emerson Dry Lake, which feeds the Joshua um, Dry Lake area, and these which are further to the west, and outside of the green circle, you have, you notice Newberry Springs, the Daggett Triangle, is on a sand transport and is currently, um, there are two pro PV projects of 5,333 acres on private lands and dust flows in the bottom. Through the pass from Lucerne Valley and Johnson Valley um, are also active sources. Is that fairly clear to everybody? It's a weird torqued map but it, it's um, the scientific publication based on this was using um, satellite imagery. Okay, here is the area that I'm looking at in Joshua Tree. There is active sand sources, Emerson Lake and Dale Drake Lake. There's the stabilized sand sheets, except where vegetation is removed. Here are three solar power plants that have been constructed. You can see the 29 Palms Marine Base in the upper center and uh, to the right angle is Joshua Tree National Park. Inside that green circle, this is Cascade Solar. Uh, it was built on the west side of Copper Mountain and below, to the right is Lear Avenue Solar and they were both constructed on sand dunes. Would you think that was not so clever? When you look at the uh, initial studies that um, told you what was happening, that was never, ever mentioned. County projects rely on air quality management district dust control plans based on fugitive dust rule 403.2, which was uh, passed in 1996 and essentially for urban areas. And it requires a two-year baseline for PM10. This is dust rising off of Cascade Solar in 2016. Uh, this 150-acre facility was built in 2014, so don't believe people when they say that they quiet down because they don't and yours don't. They're still blowing off of yours. What was the site like before destruction? In the next slide, we see uh, the... Well, actually, this is not going to be built. The CEQA lawsuit um, told next era to stop. This is the Joshua Tree Solar Project site. It was said to be heavily disturbed. This is the heavily disturbed on the upper right, not so disturbed. It's got creosote bushes, which are the bigger dots, and then the smaller ones are Gaeta grass. And Gaeta grass is the stabilizing uh, root systems that hold that in place. So if you take that out, you're toast. You, you can't breathe the air. But there's, it's still there, so it's really not um, disturbed and for most of the area. And Gaeta grass, when you look at environmental impact reports and statements and initial studies, they pay attention to uh, plants and animals that are endangered. These plants are not endangered. Their value, absolutely essential value, is the function they serve on the landscape. And that's um, the National Resources Conservation Service documents that. And in Lucerne Valley on that same day you saw the sun, the dust coming out of Cascade, you were having this um, downtown. And when I commented on, I can't remember whether it was Agincourt or uh, Project or the other one, uh, this is material that I handed in showing the dust blowing and also the kind of maps that were available then. Now we have better through Brian Hammer. The complexity of the soils that are under these areas and, but those are all characterized. You can look them up and you can find out if they're disturbed whether or not they will blow sand and dust. By the way, sand only moves about this high. Dust moves thousands of feet. So, uh, Brian Hammer has, he took um, the USDA soil survey boundary and he placed all the soils on the map. And then I went and analyzed them all 
for those that have the hazard of blowing dust, which was not a big deal for me to do. It was a wonderful deal for Brian to do. You all recognize where you are, Barstow, Lucerne Valley, there's the Daggett Triangle in Newberry Springs. Uh, we analyzed the 77, and then all of those that have the hazard of blowing dust got colored red. So any place in this map that you see, any place on the land, if you clear the vegetation, it's going to blow dust, and it will blow it forever. It's not going to come back. And you see Highway 247. You see the Ord Project, which is the black dot. Do you see? I'll, tell me if you see it or don't see it. Uh, it's on the up to the right um, below 247. You can see Victorville. Um, the AQMD provides its baseline data from Victorville, which is actually not in the area at all. Um, we go through that. Um, this is a closer look at the Ord Mountain site, which just confirms what we already I just said. And this is looking at um, County Service Area 29. That blue triangle is the town of Lucerne Valley. The pale red that's all over it is the DRECP development focus area. The solid yellow is the DRECP undesignated area. It could be development focus. The light orange, which is just up at the upper left, is future assessment area. And the dark red are the proposed solar PV projects on 5,666 acres. Question. Why would San Bernardino County permit utility solar projects on the loose, dust-filled soils of the Ice Age dry lake surrounding a community of air-breathing humans, plants, and animals? That's a good question, don't you think? Um, here's your Red Mountain solar site. It's supposed to be totally disturbed. It is not. What keeps the soil down on the ground? Saltbush scrub community, alkali soils. That's what tells you this used to be part of Lucerne Dry Lake. Back in the Ice Ages, Lucerne Dry Lake was bigger. It is the salt alkaline saltbush scrub is neither rare nor endangered. Function. Function is its value. I'll skip over this pretty fast. It's a USGS report that they did on soil service susceptibility to wind erosion. They give you the uh, characteristics. They talk about threshold friction velocity, the wind speed it takes. Um, and I'll, this is about Soda Mountain, which many of you may know about. When the USGS did this study, what they wanted to know was how much, how many hours or time during the, each month of the year did the wind blow hard enough to get uh, dust into the air. And that's the little um, grid over on the left. And Baker tells you where we are here. This, uh, these stars show you the Soda Mountain Project, which some of you may be familiar with, which was like four and a half square miles straddling the I-15. Lots of dust blowing, which was not considered. And the baseline data came out of Victorville. So vulnerability to wind erosion can be predicted and mapped. We just need to know things. We're operating in the unknown. We don't have the scientific data. The Mojave Desert planning area is in non-attainment for PM10, which is fugitive dust and a criteria pollutant. It lacks monitoring stations. And uh, as I already talked about, Victorville is its baseline. Um, the AQMD Rule 403.2 is out of date, and they know it. Oh, by the way, when I gave this before, they then put me on their technical advisory council so that I could help them out. <laughs> so we have to get data. We have to update the rules and develop monitoring protocols. We have to require complete soil surveys. <coughs> we have to get monitoring stations. And uh, we need, in order to get that um, two-year database, we need to install these where they, if the soil, the, excuse me, the solar project would be built, which so far is not on anybody's screen. But that's very similar to what the MET towers. If you're going to put up wind, you put MET towers up to tell you how the wind blows. There's now something called purple air, air quality monitoring. This is household. And we're looking into this. You can put it outside. You hook up to your um, Wi-Fi. It will measure the PM10. 
and it, you can see it up on the cloud. And uh, on a, talking to air quality people, if one is the highest uh, level of measurement you can have, this measures at a 0.6. If you are currently at zero, 0.6 is not so bad. And they agree. Um, South Coast Air Quality has got a grant to cover the certain areas of the state of California in these. Uh, and then, if that isn't enough, all of this solar that's planned for out here, on February 2nd, um, the Federal Register Executive Order, based on Executive Order 13783, to promote energy independence and economic growth, um, chose to reopen the DOECP. BLM is seeking comments on the potential impacts that land use designations contained in the amended uh, resource management plans will have no commercial scale renewable energy projects, including wind, solar, and geothermal. In particular, the BLM seeks comments on the areas of critical environmental concern that were designated, including where private land lies within the external boundaries of such designations, as well as comments on how you can increase opportunities for re renewable energy development, recreation, and off-road vehicle access, mining, and grazing. We will also expect to hear the voice of the unions because the U.S. solar industry recently lost uh, 10,000 jobs in 2017. And a lot of those were in the mature markets like California, which is at this time really built out except for um, on rooftops. So now the county. The county back in August 8, 2017, adopted the renewable energy and conservation element, but they eliminated section 410 and its subsections, which are those that would not allow solar to be built in community areas that would infringe on the quality of life and economics of the unincorporated communities. That was taken out because there was a fear that the whole thing would not be passed with it in there because the Planning Commission had not yet seen 410. The Board of Supervisors directly ordered that the Planning Commission should see Section 410 and its subsections, and it didn't say six months down the road, which it now is. This is um, Policy 410, prohibit utility-oriented renewable energy projects on sites that would create adverse impacts. Prohibit development of utility-oriented projects within the boundaries of existing community plans, which at the time of adoption of this element are, there's the list, and then 410.3 says as new come on the line, they get put in there as well, new communities. Um, so now, where are we? Six months ago, the Board of Supervisors did that direction. Terry Wayhall, Planning Director, says that Section 410 will not be going to the Planning Commission as it was when presented with renewable energy and conservation element in August. It has been revised. There will be different options that the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors can pick and choose from to create the final version of 410. The language protecting community plan areas and rural living is gone. The original will be a separate option. We will be able to review her work for comment possibly in March. Meanwhile, while this was happening, the six months, Lucerne Valley has three projects plus the state lands project. That's 5,666 acres of proposed solar. Newberry Springs has 5,533. And then on February 2nd, the federal agent says, we're going to look at DIACP again. Okay, here's the DOECP map. You see Lucerne Valley. Um, they're going to especially look at the ACECs. And the ACECs are the diagonal blue lines. And behind those are the national conservation lands, which are the orange dots. So here it is a little clearer. See those diagonal blue lines? They're supposed to be protected forever. Not. Um, if the DOECP is open. Do you see the Highway 247 that's going up to Barstow? You see a little bit, the pink there is the development focus areas. All of that white that's in there is private land. 
This um, BLM wants to know where private lands lie within the external boundaries of such designations. This is the private lands within CSA 20, all of the chartreuse. Those are the private lands. Most of the land within the development focus area is private. Public lands, 13 square miles. Private lands, 90. And then there's some other public lands. What can we do? There's a petition you can sign that is asking the Board of Supervisors to push on Planning Commission for Section 4.10 and its subsections and also attend meetings so that you can speak up. Community members know that key to the demise of their air quality from fugitive dust is the transmission lines existing and proposed. So the transition lines, lines are the ones, the black lines coming down, do you see those? And then the, yeah, and then the star is showing you the proposed substation, and then you see the proposed new transmission lines coming in from the top, got that? This is not a good picture. Lucerne Valley, 5,666 solar PV within the red. Newberry Springs, 5,533. Air quality monitoring stations, nowhere near. Um, any utility scale solar project in the red area will be a dust producer when soils are dry and winds reach threshold velocity. This is Newberry Springs. These are their projects. As just like you, they are on a linear dune. Again, action time, sign the petition and attend a meeting. These are the meetings, February 28th, 5 to 7, in Hesperia at the Courtyard Marriott, March 1st in Joshua Tree, 6 to 8, actually. And I have some copies of this because I didn't actually think you would remember it all. So I'm glad to give them out to you. I think I have about 29, so if, um, I think there's enough for everybody in the room. And um, we see the black-throated sparrow considering the wisdom of a drink from Cascade Solar in Joshua Tree Basin. Good decisions require data and analysis, and we don't have those. So there I am. How did I do? Okay, do we, do we have any time for questions or not? We can take a couple of questions. Is none of what you're showing us a basis to get some kind of a corporate or stop it until it really gets looked at properly? No, the court can't stop it till it gets looked at. What we have to do is deal with the planning department and we need to get 410 passed. If 410 goes through, the planning commission is passed, is reviewed and passed, and then goes to the Board of Supervisors. So we need to make a lot of noise and be very public. Um, then it will not, they will not accept applications. That is where we have to, we have to stop the applications. We may still have to deal with the ones that are um, on the table. Yes, and Terry Rahal wants to know why we're not busy doing her um, community plans. <laughs> so, and any other questions? Yes. you wish not to have solar at all? Is it your position not to have solar at all? My position is that solar, utility scale solar, which clears large areas of land in the desert and would release volumes of dust into the atmosphere, which is, I'm telling you why, I don't want solar on any of those places. Unfortunately, we are the victims of the ice age. And so we live in areas where Ice Age dust is blowing into our area and has been there for a long time. And if we take the plants out, there will be no healthy quality of life. You will not be able to breathe. So that, no, I don't want solar in low elevation, flat areas that contain dust in which they would need to remove the plants holding it on. The problem, the problem is, is once the soil is disturbed here, 
it, it's going to be a dust generator, dust generator forever. Um, and, and you guys know the wind blows out here just about every day. And um, well, we're, we're trying. That's the best we can do is we can try. But we're also not going to increase it if we can help it. Yeah, there's been some pro big projects stopped uh, in uh, Joshua Tree and uh, Landers, I think. They've stopped some big projects. So we're not done fighting. We know that. No, they will not. The reason they won't is because they keep driving trucks over it between the rows of solar panels to fix them. Twice a year. Well, what I'm saying is that, sure, they do that, but then when they drive their, their repair and maintenance trucks over it several times a year, it's going to negate all that. So every time you drive a truck across the, across the desert here and you break that top crust, you've created a dust cloud. Okay, we need to move on. Is there any other questions? Are you trying to raise your hand back there? No. where you place them, you can get really significant different readings. Is there, uh, uh, is there any ideal way as to how these things should be considered as far as uh, being cited? Uh, purple Air is being looked at by California Air Resources Board. I am in contact with them. Also, Southern California uh, Air Quality Management District. So this is all being worked on. And there's nothing to stop you from putting it on your house if you get dust that gives you a dust reading, which you aren't going to get any other way. Okay, one last question, then we've got to move on. Uh, there is no benefit. There, you go. Yeah, there is no benefit. There's no jobs created for our community. Um, they don't pay property taxes on that, and yet the sheriff still has to go out there for law enforcement. Fire department has to go out there for fire and medical, and there's no reimbursement. They're getting all those services for free. Now, in the big picture, you can say, well, that keeps the cost of electricity down, but that doesn't help our quality of life here in town. So I'm, I'm not opposed to they can build all the solar plants they want down in Los Angeles. That'd be great. They don't have the same dust wind problems we do. Um, they get almost as much sunlight. Anyway, that's it. We have to move on. So, Pat, thank you very much. Okay, now on to our reports. Uh, San Bernardino County Sheriff, you are up. And that is... Who is that? Uh, yeah, Sergeant Daniel Rodriguez. Sorry I didn't have your name memorized. Fairly new here. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, these reports I have are, are for uh, beginning January 1st through January 31st. In the Apple Valley County areas, uh, we had 440 calls for service with a total of 52 DRs drawn or reports drawn. And in the Lucerne Valley area, um, we had 654 calls for service with 69 reports drawn. And a little uh, information from our narcotics division. Those of you who are at the La Vida meeting heard all this. Um, in January, uh, they served several warrants for illegal marijuana grows. Uh, addresses were 12144 Lunar Road in Lucerne Valley, uh, 38150 Foothill Road, Lucerne Valley, 42480 Buckeye Lane. Can we put that one on, on Foothill? Foothill. It's 38150. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so during the service of the search warrants, um, they located a total of 555 marijuana plants out of all three places. Uh, over 50 pounds of processed marijuana were seized during the search warrants, and several arrests were made. 
off of the Lunar Road uh, search warrant. Clemente Lopez, 48-year-old transient, was arrested from that location. Uh, the Foothill address, um, there were Leonel De La Mora, he's 23 year old, claiming he's from Lucerne Valley. Uh, Luis Martinez Garcia, also 23 year old, uh, from Lucerne Valley. And the Buckeye Lane search warrant uh, arrest was made for Jorge Gonzalez, 31 year old, out of Santa Ana. So, as a Sheriff's Department Narcotics Division, uh, if you guys have any info for us, don't hesitate to call. Um, our narcotics division is very busy with illegal marijuana grows, as you know, with the law passing at the beginning of the year. Um, everyone's growing marijuana, and they're trying to do it any way they can. So please call us if, if uh, you find any out there that uh, we may not know about. We appreciate it. Would a little greenhouse behind the house count as uh, growing plants in your home? No. No, greenhouses don't count. It has to be a solid structure. No glass, no tarps. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Cal Fire? I mean, San Bernardino County Fire? That San Bernardino County Fire is near. I can't read my own agenda, sorry. Hi, uh, Bill Mahan, uh, Battalion Chief for San Bernardino County Fire, overseeing the station here as well as those in Hesperia. Um, I don't have a whole lot to report tonight. Uh, just looking at the stats from last month, looks like uh, we had about 150 calls for the station. Uh, obviously, the majority of medical. Uh, a few structure fire dispatches that didn't really turn out to be much, food on the stove and that sort of thing. Um, and, of course, received assistance from CAL FIRE on some miscellaneous type fires and, and vice versa. We provided assist to them. But uh, station level wise, we're still working on the uh, remodel project for the station, uh, adding a couple of bedrooms and some ADA uh, uh, restroom facilities. And the current crisis of the day is uh, having an issue with the uh, HVAC unit that we're dealing with getting repaired. So um, in a nutshell, that's, that's about it for the, for the local fire report. Any questions? That's not county fire. And, and that's not CDF either. He can't answer any questions on that because it's, he's, he's not involved. You have to get all your state representatives. Nope. I don't believe it was. All right, thank you, sir. Good evening, my name is Drew Smith, I'm with, uh, Captain with CAL FIRE. And about your question about the SRA fee, it is suspended at the moment. And uh, I, as far as long term, I can't answer that, but, but that's the message that we have is suspended. Uh, there's nothing really to report. Uh, characteristic this time of year, fire activity is low. There's still a fire danger everywhere uh, because of we still haven't had a significant measure amount of rainfall. But uh, characteristically, this is our slower time of year. Because of, this is our slower time of year, uh, we are doing fuels projects. Nothing really on the radar in Lucerne Valley, Apple Valley, through there, uh, Yucca Valley. We're looking at uh, a fuel reduction project in the Covington Flats area. No, no, Covington Park area. But uh, that's still going through, through a lot of uh, approval process. So it might be early to talk about that, but that is something that we're, we're looking at. Uh, a lot of our resources are being, being shoveled around, and we're doing fuel reduction projects up on the mountaintop. It doesn't really affect this area. And... Uh, that's what I have to report. Any questions at all? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, wait, there is one question. Two things. One, what is the phone number to call about burning? Right now, there's not burning. But okay. Uh, you can do the local station, and I can get you, I can get you two numbers. How's that? You want me to do, I can do it right now.
Okay, the Lucerne Valley Station, 760-248-7525. Let me get to the Apple Valley one. Okay, the Apple Valley Cal Fire Station is 760-247-3039. Because the Lucerne Valley one, I never get an answer. You know, right now we're going through transitional staffing. That, that station is staffed with two personnel. They're out doing uh, LA 100 inspections among the area. So they're in and out of the office all day long. Um, the Apple Valley one will have more consistent staffing. So uh, you'll, you'll most likely be able to reach them. And on that note, we are doing LA 100s in the area still. It doesn't really change. We're still doing it in the, in the summertime and the wintertime. Because of uh, our, our reduced activity, we have more time to concentrate on, on our inspections. Is there any guess that there will be any burning in the Cal Fire area this year? Usually, uh, when there's a significant amount of rainfall, they'll, cons they'll, they'll evaluate the fire risk and fire danger. Uh, at the moment, we still don't have the numbers. We are getting rain. We are getting elevated humidity at night for that recovery. But for the most part, it's still not past that threshold to safely burn. Does that, that help you out? Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Frank, CSA 29 report. Good evening. Frank Haggard, Special Districts. I'm the District Services Coordinator here for Lucerne Valley, also in Joshua Tree and Wonder Valley. I also help oversee your television district. So if you have concerns about TV reception, uh, you can talk to me about that. I have a few things I just wanted to review this evening uh, quickly. Uh, we have some staffing updates. I know last uh, month Reese reported regarding uh, our television person, Scott Fritz, retiring, and we have replaced him with uh, Clinton Tipton, who was our PSE assisting Scott at the time. We did uh, go out to hire for that position, and it turned out that Clinton was the best qualified and the best match for that position, so we were happy to be able to promote him to a full-time uh, benefited position. We also have posted recently Clinton's position as a part-time service employee, and uh, that position closed recently, so we're hoping to hire his replacement soon. That position is also key because they also help out with the maintenance of the grounds in Oro Grande and El Mirage. A uh, couple maintenance projects that have been going on. It's that time of year where we've done a lot of trimming, a lot of removal of all the leaves that blew up in our parks. Uh, but that's, that's been completed very quickly. I think our parks look really lovely. If you guys ever see things that you find need to be addressed, please call the office here and uh, we'll get on that. We're doing a phase two improvement project at Russell Park that is funded by a $12,500 grant that was provided by the Mojave Water Agency. It's a strategic partnership grant. And with that grant, we are currently installing um, things like new barbecues, picnic tables, trash receptacles, um, a new 180 foot fence around the new playground area that was installed there and it's going to make that park a really nice um, family friendly park to visit and then along those lines uh, we also applied I just um, submitted a grant for next year through the same funding agency through the Mojave Water Agency and uh, we are requesting an additional $25,000 to install a 24 by 24 metal shade structure at that facility which would be a um, very nice element to complete that park. We've installed a lot of new trees, but it'll take a while for those to actually provide uh, sub substantial shade benefit to that area. So we're hoping that that would be uh, kind of a completing phase for that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when we'll, the findings will come out for that grant, but we'll report to you how that goes. Um, the biggest thing I need to report to you this evening is regarding to the red, white, and boom that we're trying to um, fundraise for again this year. The um, date we're looking at is going to be June 30th, and the reason it's so early is because that's actually a Saturday night. Um, the 4th of July falls on a Wednesday this year, and in order for us to coordinate with the pyrotechnics company 
and then to also have a day uh, a, a day where people aren't going to work the next day the first day we could actually do it would be the 30th of June um, it's I know Reese reported last time that it was about fourteen thousand dollars but actually when I'm, uh, we fine-tune the budget it looks like we're going to need to raise nineteen thousand dollars which is quite a stretch for one event but that includes obviously um, everything from the fireworks display security portable toilets and entertainment and promotion of the event uh, you should anticipate if you're a local business or anybody in the community that um, has in the past funded or supported this event you should anticipate some sponsorship letters going out by the end of this month um, and finally I just want to I wanted to mention that our uh, Memorial Park continues to be very busy and I would recommend that if anybody's considering a pre-need situation to please contact us in advance because I've been in two situations recently where people did not have funding available and it's a really stressful situation when the family doesn't have funds available and they need to bury somebody and uh, it's one of those unfortunate situations you don't really plan for your own death but if you have arrangements made in advance it's very helpful for the family particularly since um, with the County of San Bernardino we can, we're not able to wait until the settlement comes from the life insurance company whereas a lot of families will rely on the life insurance money to pay for funerals a lot of uh, funeral homes memorial parks will uh, allow that to happen but as a special district we can't do that we have to have all the funding up up front and then I also wanted to share I have got a couple flyers here um, one was uh, came through I think this is a very interesting opportunity um, the County of San Bernardino is partnering with the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources um, provided here on March 17th at the Victor Valley Community uh, County Museum uh, they're going to be doing a growing fruit trees at home and preserving locally grown produce in the morning and then selecting and carry for, caring for drought efficient trees and shrubs in the afternoon. So I brought extra flyers for everybody if you want, if that interests you. And then I've got flyers that talk about the red, white, and boom, just so we can start getting that on the radar because it'll be here before you know it. We actually have to have the first down payment to the pyrotechnics company by April 2nd. Okay, any questions? $19,000? Yes, that's correct. Oh, Frank, yes. uh, keep in mind, too, in the back of your mind, a, a grant for a, the water park we'd like to do. I yeah. know that's going to be down the road a ways, but... That will be a long-term goal because that's a su substantial funding. And leave a little bit of space there at the park, too. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right. Great. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Frank. Uh, next is the Land Use Committee. Uh, I don't have anything to report for this month. We talked about it last month, our work that we did for the uh, uh, community uh, updated community plan. Uh, I did want to mention at this time that. Uh, a couple of us are going to meet with the Environmental Health Services Department regarding the biohazard waste out here. Um, and I think, Mark, you put that together. Was that, you put that, yeah, Mark putting that together. Cemetery Committee. Frank, since Reese has like moved way up the food chain, okay. I'll just get the one day here. Uh, he's only here like one or two days a week, so make an appointment. <laughs> Can you give her one of your cards, Frank? Okay. Okay, correspondence. I did get something here from the county. Uh, actually, it's from LAFCO. Um, as you may or may not know, we do have a vacancy on the board here. And so LAFCO, this is news, new to me, but LAFCO is in the middle of this now for uh, requesting uh, uh, a notice of vacancy for the public member of the local, uh, wait a minute, hold on a second. 
Yeah, notice of vacancy for the public member of the local agency formation commission. I had that wrong. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, uh, there's an opening for that. You really want to get bogged down in government stuff. And also a notice of vacancy for an alternate public member of the local agency formation commission. I only gave you one of these to post. I need to give you the other one. So I, mis I misread that. Okay. Anybody else have any correspondence? Oh, oh I probably didn't, did I? Sir, Mark, I so apologize. I checked it off like I asked you, but... Mark, go ahead. I'm totally sorry. Uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I'll keep it short. Um, Roger has already indicated that uh, there's a problem with uh, bio waste up in the area. In fact, uh, at the Levita meeting, we got hit pretty hard on that. and uh, It was news to me since I'm pretty new to this area. I'm not new to the desert, but I'm new to Lucerne Valley. So we requested uh, personnel from EHS uh, to come out and take a look at what's going on out here and hopefully testing the materials to make sure what's in it. Uh, I talked to the lady that uh, was here earlier. Uh, she's still here about the bio waste, yeah. And we're going to try to get that crew out here once uh, we meet and take a look at what you got. So uh, we know approximately where you live on, is it Rabbit Trail? Yeah. Rabbit Springs, right, yeah. I think, I think Chuck knows where you live. Um, other than that, the, uh, we're pushing, um, our office is pushing very hard on, on what Pat was speaking about tonight on, on uh, 4.10, which was uh, in uh, the rec, uh, trying to get that back through uh, as written. Uh, there was, uh, and as she stated, there was some variations that they were going to put in there, some what they call enhance enhancements and um, some options. And uh, we've asked her if that has to happen, then we would like one of the options to be the exactly like it was written originally to get back to the Planning Commission. So we've been pushing hard on that. Uh, I'll, I'll, when I get back, I'll take a look at the uh, solid waste. I'll give them a call. I know that that's been a problem not only in this area, but uh, we've had problems in, in our two uh, uh, contractors in our areas with the same kind of complaints. We've got a transfer station in uh, uh, 29 Palms, and of course we've got the Landers dump. So there's been some issues there, and I'll get together with them and i got to tell you, in the past, they've been very cooperative and uh, very uh, proactive in getting that taken care of. So if you've got any issues with that, give Roger or myself a call. Um, I'll leave a card here on the table, and uh, we'll try to get that done. Other than that, uh, we've got business as usual. Uh, the other, uh, Richard brought up the, the senior housing. He did give me the, the uh, booklet that they have made up on their feasibility study, which is quite extensive, and I'm about a quarter of the way through it now. Uh, but my thought is, and I'm going to take a look at some of the cities that we have, the incorporated areas that do have housing, and uh, see what kind of a uh, match that they're, they're looking for. I know, for instance, that Yucca Valley on the senior housing donated the land, and I think that's uh, Richard uh, indicated the land is already available and been donated. And then, uh, again, infrastructure was, most of the infrastructure was there, which is a big part of it. But I want to find out uh, exactly how they did it, uh, what kind of incentive they had to give uh, to the operator of it. And obviously, you're going to have to either a nonprofit or a company run it. Uh, their particular company is called Core, uh, C-O-R-E. They're a big, they're a big uh, player in the senior citizen housing. So we'll take a look at that too, and maybe actually we can get something going on that if I can get some information from the town of Yucca Valley on exactly how they swung that uh, senior housing. So other than that, uh, that's about it. And thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah, Mark, don't rush out after the meeting. I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Okay, Roger. All right. All right. All right, we're going to, information action items, we're going to skip over the water park at, Ru at Russell Park since we already uh, discussed it with Frank. Uh, we have no action, uh, no action items tonight. Uh, council members, do you have any requests or reports? Okay, our next meeting will be March 15th, uh, 2018 here at this building.
at uh, 5 p.m. With that, the meeting is adjourned.